the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing, elf, el, do nothing out of selfish, selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking at your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a human being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to, to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks very much indeed, Gordon. Please keep that passage open. We're going to be looking at that in detail. And I'm just going to get this as well. Fantastic. So we're beginning a new series today, When Christians Disagree, and it is a fact Christians disagree. Unfortunately, but they do. So to be a Christian, as you do have to agree on some things. Um, and uh, before we get on to that, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this chance to be together, to be united in mind and heart and spirit. And we pray as we think about these words, as we process our own thoughts, as we bring our own experiences of disagreeing with others, as we submit to you. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us and help us to understand this challenging subject. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, to be a Christian, you need to agree really that God is our Father um, and that he is uh, Trinity, God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, we believe in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the return of Jesus, his second coming, and that Jesus' death for our sins, um, uh, the last judgment, and uh, salvation through faith are all absolutely key to our understanding. And these would be primary issues. These are things which are in the creeds um, that uh, are said in different services. And um, they are things which you, Christians are united around. When, um, if there's a, an element of a creed that you don't agree about, then you're probably not a Christian. Okay, so that's just a fact, and um, people would say you're, you'd have a different belief system. But, so they're primary issues. There are lots and lots of secondary issues, secondary, not as important as primary, where Christians disagree. So, for example, uh, infant baptism, gifts of the Holy Spirit, worship styles. These things, amongst many others, have actually split churches into different denominations through the ages. And then there are issues uh, like ethic, ethics, ethical issues. So um, same-sex relationships we've talked about has been in the press, abortion, uh, contraception, fertility treatments, therapeutic cloning, euthanasia, withdrawal of treatments, alternative medicine, healing. These are just some of the disagreements and misunderstandings that happen 
um, between Christians as they, as they wrestle with complex subjects where the scriptures seem to, um, people can come to different conclusions as they look at the scriptures. Um, and that's let alone just basically people misunderstanding each other or spelling mistakes which actually people have arguments about, you know, which spelling you're going to take on a particular word in a, in a translation of the Greek, or um, just because people are just darn right argumentative, and that causes disagreements. So there are masses and masses of things in the church that people disagree about. And the question um, is this, why, you know, what are we to do uh, about Christians, you know, where, where Christians disagree, how are we to handle that? And the reason we're looking at this series is... Um, is in particular because we uh, came up with some disagreements uh, recently in our PCC. It's um, our church council, which is elected in the church over the appointment of a curate who's coming in the summer. And we're delighted that Alexandra Lilly is coming. She um, is a fantastic um, uh, person in her own right, very, very gifted, and she's going to be coming here. She was invited, um, she, she, uh, the bishop of Stepney invited us to um, train her and we, we came up with, uh, we brought this to the PCC, and actually there were some people on the PCC who um, really wanted to process this, to wrestle with this. And there are a number of different things that Christians disagree about when it comes to the ordination of women. Um, and I just want to show you a little process that we went through in the PCC. I'm not going to go through it in detail. But you can see through all these arrows and boxes and things, these were the kinds, this is a process that we needed to think through in order to look at the whole subject of whether it was important, uh, whether we should appoint this um, lady to be a curate. And I just want to point out this bottom right-hand corner. You can look in this in more detail later if you like. But there are, I think there are about five, at least five, different ways of thinking about um, a, the way a woman leads in a public place in, in, in church. So um, there's controversy uh, in the church about whether women can lead at all. There's other con um, uh, um, difficulties about people, whether, they should, whether women should be ordained or not as leaders in the church. Uh, other controversy around um, women teaching from the front. Others about actually uh, women being okay to, uh, to be ordained, but not to lead congregations or lead churches, and that leads to um, the, the, the current debate around the leading of dioceses, so a, a woman being a bishop. Now, Christians, these are secondary issues. They're, um, whether, you know, there are the different views of how women can lead in different ways in church. And actually, for us as a PCC, we didn't really have a problem with women leading others. We didn't have a problem with women being ordained. We didn't have a problem with women teaching from the front in church, but where there was an issue was about women leading churches. Now, Alexandra's uh, coming in the summer, and she wasn't, wasn't coming to lead this church, but she was coming to be trained to lead churches in the future. And so it was a very important thing about whether we could um, get behind this to say, yes, we're going to train this person to lead churches. Because some found it difficult to think, actually, I'm not sure I could support a woman leading a church. Fine about these other things. And so it became a debate that we had to wrestle with. And... I have to say that we went through this process and we concluded that, um, well, just before the conclusion, one of the things, you know, for some it was an issue that was raised, and for others, the fact that the issue was being raised at all was an issue. And so there was disagreement. We love each other, we have a fantastic PCC, we, we have been in unity. Um, every single time we meet, all through our time together over the last nine years, and different people have been on the PCC through that time. But what um, this process that we went through, we needed to actually slow the thing down, just go through things step by step, to actually work out where people stood and how we were going to reach a consensus. And in the end, we didn't agree with all of these things. We didn't say, yes, I'm, every single person has to agree with the... Um, with a, a position of a, a woman leading a church. We didn't reach that agreement. But what we did reach was a consensus about the way forwards, and we were united in backing the decision to appoint Alexandra as a curate here. Does that make sense? So there was still, we weren't in one mind, if you like, about, the, about whether women should be leading churches, 
but we were in one mind about appointing Alexandra to this role to be trained to lead churches. That was an important thing that we got to. There are many ways in which Christians disagree. Within the church, as they look at the scriptures, we're going to be looking a little bit about that next week, Um, and actually Christians with culture, we have disagreements. And so in this series, we're going to be looking at different letters that Paul wrote to the churches where there were disagreements. There have been disagreements right from the beginning. So if you say, oh, we should be like the early church, well, the early church had plenty of disagreements. Um, Part of the New Testament is all about actually addressing those disagreements. So what should we do when Christians disagree? Um, If you haven't seen me do this before, I like drawing pictures just to um, help kind of... um, Uh, embed what I'm trying to say in the mind. The first thing is that we're not to let disagreements get personal. So um, if you look at, um, uh, this is a wall. And we've got um, two people. They're actually going to be two women. And I'll say why in a minute. They're not very happy with each other. They've got a disagreement, and they've let it get personal. Would you just look at, Philippians 2 is open, just look across the page to Philippians 4. Part of what Paul is writing to is their own situation. He says this, verse 2 of chapter 4. I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, Help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. So there were disagreements in the Philippian church. You've got these two women who were outstanding leaders and co-workers with Paul in the church. One's called Euodia, the other's called Syntyche. And they've got this disagreement that has bubbled to the surface and everyone knows about it. I think the sad thing is, what do you want to be known for? Well, Euodia and Syntyche are known for having had a disagreement. That's what they're known for um, throughout history. Just think about when you have disagreements, what you want to be known for, just in case it gets recorded for a long time for everyone to see. But they had this disagreement. We don't know, Paul doesn't say in his letter what it's about. I think that's really, really important. How is he dealing with this? He's dealing with it to try and solve or help their relationship with each other. He doesn't deal with a specific issue. He says, I plead with you, Yodia. I plead with you, Syntyche. Sort out your problems. Be of the same mind in the Lord. He's not taking sides. He say, be of the same mind. I think he's not saying be in agreement with each other in terms of what you're arguing about, because they might not be able to find agreement, but have an attitude of mind that means that you can um, reach a consensus of some kind, that you can be in relationship with each other. We can effectively say, Paul is saying, We don't want this wall to be there. We want you to be able to get on with each other, to be of the same mind. Have you ever had disagreements with people in church? Sometimes it's very, very painful because our brothers and sisters in Christ, we, I think we feel an extra pain when there's a disagreement, when there's a hurt of some kind that can't be resolved or it's difficult to resolve. Or perhaps you feel hard done by, uh, perhaps by a leader of the church or by someone who is um, in uh, authority over you. You feel um, on the, on the, on the, on a negative side of that uh, relationship. Or perhaps you've been misunderstood by someone and it's painful. It's like there's a wall that's gone up. And, And Paul is saying, we don't want any walls in our relationships with each other. This picture, I think it's a fantastic picture. You might see Louis on the left-hand, bottom left-hand corner of that group. It's a YWAM group from 1989. Um, And uh, this is a a couple of days before the Berlin Wall came down. And I love the graffiti image on the left-hand top corner, which says, walls are not everlasting. That wall came down two days later. 
And so there's another photograph of um, a couple of this team, this YWAM team, scaling the wall about a week later um, when they'd, um, they'd gone off to um, uh, another country and come back. And you know, the whole situation in Berlin had, had completely changed. When there's a disagreement, we are not to let it fester. We must not get bitter about it. We are not to gossip or complain um, to someone else or to lots of someone else's. We're to deal with it. Paul pleads with these um, two women. Go to the person and address it. That's the place to start. Go to the person that you have the disagreement with and address that disagreement rather than letting it get personal. And only if it doesn't get anywhere are we to raise it with others. I think it's intriguing um, when uh, Paul writes in verse 3, Yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women. The true companion, we're not sure who that is. Perhaps it was the writer uh, or the, the person who's carrying the letter from Paul to the Philippians, my true companion. Or perhaps it was one of the leaders of the church. Or perhaps it's just an open ad- address to any of us, if you're a true companion of the gospel, then you will intervene in the lives of people who have disagreements with each other. So we're not to um, ignore it. We need to play our part in helping people to um, get sorted. Um, There's a, a, a statue that was built in 1904 on the border between Chile and Argentina in the Andes. It's called Christ of the Andes. And it was built as a marker to, um, to be an agreement between Chile and Argentina, who have a, a, a long border, that they wouldn't fight against each other. And this was the symbol, a symbol of unity, of love, of peace. But as soon as it was built, there was a problem with it, because the uh, statue faced Argentina. And the Chileans got really, really upset about it because they, they took it as a slight. And they said, look, it's unfair. You know, um, Jesus' back is pointing towards Chile, um, but he's facing Argentina. They're obviously um, more favored. And just when this argument got, got to almost fever pitch amongst the Chileans, there was an editor of a newspaper who um, addressed it nationally and saved the day um, in something he wrote um, by you know, addressing the situation, but adding a little humor with it. And he said this, the people of Argentina need to be kept an eye on more than the Chileans. <laughs> a little bit of humor often really addresses um, problems with disagreements. But we're not to let disagreements get personal. That's the first thing we see in this letter. Second thing is that we are encouraged to follow the values of Jesus. There's that statue there. Can you see it? So we're to follow the values of Jesus. And um, I think the point here that I want to make is that it's okay to disagree, but it's how we disagree that matters. Uh, And that matters because it affects our relationships with each other. And just notice how many times Paul says, come to one mind. So look at verse 2 of chapter 2. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, Verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had. Verse, uh, chapter 4 and verse 2, he says to Euodia and Syntyche, be of the same mind in the Lord. So how are we to do this? How are we to have the same mind? Well, the values of Jesus we see just coming through here. The first is to go for the best. Go for the best in our relationships with each other. So I don't know if you remember when we had um, our value series. We had aim high was one of our values. And we're to go for the best in our relationships with each other. Look at chapter 1. Chapter 1 and verse 2. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. Verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters... So if God is our father and you and I are brothers and sisters, then we are sons and daughters of God. Look at 1 verse 9, chapter 1 verse 9. This is my prayer, Paul is praying, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern 
what is best. In our relationships, we need to aim high. We need to go for the best to be able to discern what is best in our relationships with one another. That's the first value we see. The second value is about seeking unity. Seeking unity. Let's go this way. John Bernard values. We talked about enjoying it together. So that's the baby Geary there. And enjoy it together. As we kind of draw it as, a, as a, an arrow like that. Jesus prayed, and we prayed this earlier in the uh, morning, uh, for unity in the body of Christ. In, in John 17, his, his prayer for the disciples and for uh, the disciples of disciples, that's us in the church, for unity, that we might be one just as um, we are one when Jesus was talking about his unity in the Trinity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Why is unity so important? Why are we to seek unity in the church? Well, one of the core reasons is so that the world might believe in Jesus. When it looks at the church, we're called to love one another so that the world might know that you're my disciples, Jesus said. So in our very mission as a church, we are to um, be united so that when people look at us, people can believe in Jesus. When there's disunity, people just switch off. If you notice in things like political parties, when there's infighting in a political party, popularity of that party goes down. It's exactly the same in the church. When Christians disagree with each other, people just switch off, just think it's irrelevant. But when they're united, in spite of their disagreements, that's powerful, and that communicates so much. So um, look at the way Paul deals with this. Chapter 2, verse 1. He talks about being united in our identity. He says, um, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, it's all about Jesus. Everything revolves around him. We're to be united in our relationships, um, uh, in, involving our heart and mind and spirit. So if you have any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion make my joy complete, being of one in spirit and in mind, having the same mind, united in our relationships with each other, in every aspect of our relationships, and being united in the gospel, just um, at the top of that page, Philippians 1 verse 27. He says, um, I will know that you stand firm in, in the one spirit, striving together with one accord for the faith of the gospel. We are to stand firm in the one spirit, striving together with one accord for the faith of the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, I love the way that it's described um, in, uh, in Philippians, but just if you take a step back, the message of Philippians is that the good news, the gospel, is that, um, that love overcame the biggest disagreement of all. That the love of God, who is holy, who is pure, overcame that huge gap between us who are impure, who are unholy, who are sinful, who are mere created beings. That huge gap, a problem of sin, was overcome, that disagreement, if you like, was overcome with the love of God. That God sent his son, Jesus, to come to us, to die on a cross, that the issue of disagreement was sorted that we could entrust Jesus with our sins so that actually we could have agreement with God. We are to seek unity. There's an old proverb that says, if a link is broken, the whole chain breaks. Seek unity. I love what J. John says around the subject. None of us has got it together, but together we've got it. Seek unity, enjoy it with others. A third value that we see here is to practice humility. When we draw this on our values, it's about bowing the knee. We need to separate character and identity, our identity in Christ, from the issue itself. 
Because if the issue that we're disagreeing about is um, bound up in who we are, we start getting really defensive if people disagree with us. Or we get proud in st standing our ground and not being able to listen to others. We think, actually, I'm going to st stick to what I think is right um, in terms of um, not being able to listen at all to others. And we become obstinate and difficult. And the way through that is to practice humility. Paul says here, we've got to have the same attitude of mind as Christ Jesus, verse 5. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He let go of his natural, uh, legal, and social status and made himself nothing, verse 7. He took the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus took the path to downward mobility. He took the path to humble service. He took the path to unselfish love. The message says it like this. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. And the result of this humility of Jesus is that God exalted him, verse 9, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, the person who looks up to God on their knees very rarely looks down on people. If there is disagreement, we must bow the knee and practice humility. And a fourth value that we see here is to love generously. We just draw this by having a present that we give away. When it comes to the issue of women in leadership, there are different views in the church. But we are to practice love generously when we think about this or any other issue where Christians disagree. Think about the um, Corinthians who um, the, the letters that Paul writes to the Corinthians are just full of dissent in, in that church. And he's trying to address that um, situation. But you'll remember the famous um, chapter, chapter 13, where Paul writes about love being the most important thing of all. You'll recognize these words. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And so as we come back to the Philippian situation, Paul again writes into their situation, says, love, love generously. Look at verse, uh, chapter 2 and verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. And verse 4. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. One of my favorite Conversations was between a reporter and Leonard Bernstein, who's a, a conductor and composer. And he was asked, what's the most difficult instrument to play in the orchestra? And he said, without hesitation, second violin. And then second flute or second trombone. He said, it's easy to play first violin, but to, say, to play second, that's more difficult. But if no one is prepared to play second, there will be no harmony. Do 
love generously. When there are disagreements, love generously. Give away love. So in disagreements, we're to follow the values of Jesus. And thirdly, we're never to give up. Here's the finish line. There's the track. We're never to give up. Chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. We must continue to play our part in seeing conflict cease and harmony come. We must be open to being challenged, to have a posture of learning where we're prepared to learn new things, to change our perspective if, if if, if, that's, if we're ready to. To listen to different points of view so that our understanding can be sharpened. And we know that as we do that, like working out our, um, our salvation in fear and trembling, as we do that, we know that God is working within us to fulfill his good purposes. What a wonderful promise. That's something which we can continue to do with one another and something we can all go for together. I just want to tell you a story. Once upon a time, there were two brothers. And for over 40 years, these two brothers worked side by side on adjacent farms. They shared their equipment, they had fun together, they worked hard on their own farms, but tried to work um, together where possible. And then one day, a rift between the brothers developed. It was a small misunderstanding that blew up into a big row. And um, finally, there was just a bitter exchange of words, and they stopped speaking with each other. And for months and months, this went on. And one day... The eldest brother, it was called Pete, was out in his fields and um, a truck pulled up. And a man jumped out of the truck and approached Pete, had a, a carpenter's toolbox in his hand. And he said, I'm looking for a few days' work. Do you have a few small jobs that I could do? And Pete said, yes, I, I actually do. Have a look at this creek down here. This is the border between my brother's farm and my farm. My brother keeps it nice and deep so that it's impossible to cross. And so I'd like to oblige him. You see all that timber over there by the barn? Please would you build a very high fence at the bottom of that ravine so that it's absolutely clear um, that I don't need to see my stinking brother ever again. And the carpenter was glad of the work. He just said, well, point me to where those, um, the, the, um, the driving posts are so that I can put the fence up and I'll get the job done. So the carpenter set out working and meanwhile, Pete drove into town to go and buy some sheep. And when he um, came back at the end of the day, he was a little bit shocked at what the carpenter had done. There was no fence. The carpenter instead had built a bridge. And over the bridge as he was coming home, his brother was walking towards him. And he held out his hand and spoke to his brother and said this, Pete, after all I've done to you these past few weeks, I can't believe you'd still reach out to me. You're right. It's time to bury the hatchet. And the two brothers met in the middle of this bridge and they embraced each other. 
And they turn to see the carpenter um, take up his bag of tools and um, go back to his truck. And the man, uh, Pete, said, no, wait, stay a few days. I've got a lot of other projects for you. And the carpenter said this, I'd love to stay on, but I have more bridges to build. Would you like to stand? <laughs>